Uh, well, welcome to the second of this series of revisiting uh, Whitley lectures uh, that have been given in the past. Uh, and this evening we're revisiting uh, Ruth Goldman's Whitley lecture, Reinventing the Wheel, first delivered in 1997. Uh, and it was called Reinventing the Wheel, as I said, subtitle Women and Ministry in English Baptist Life. Uh, and perhaps uh, you have revisited it, having perhaps read it many years ago. Perhaps you were there when it was delivered uh, um, or perhaps um, you've been reading it for the first time uh, in preparation for this. But uh, it's great to welcome Beth Allison Glenny, uh, who is the chaplain and tutor in theology at Regent's Park College and is currently on sabbatical but she's uh, broken her sabbatical to join us this evening uh, to give a little bit of an introduction uh, to Ruth's Whitley Lecture and perhaps to drop us a few questions as we then explore it together and or re-explore it together. We should also note that um, we're rereading this uh, lecture uh, in the year uh, that Project Violent, uh, which was uh, launched a few years ago to be a project to do some research into women in ministry, is about to re uh, share its report in May later. Uh, and hopefully you might be aware of their podcast that they're um, sharing at the moment and that report coming in May. Do look out for that. Uh, but I'm going to hand over to uh, my friend Beth, who's going to share a little bit about her reading of the lecture and some questions. Over to you, Beth. Thank you. Andy says I can only speak for 10 minutes um, on this, so it's going to be really fast. <laughs> I've got so many thoughts about this lecture. And one of the first things I wanted to say is when I read it for the first time, um, it was about 11 years old. So um, uh, I read it in about 2009, 2010. Actually, that's, yeah, it's a good math. Uh, when I was writing my undergrad dissertation um, on Anne Steele, one of the women named in the lecture. Um, and so Steve Holmes, who was my dissertation supervisor, passed me it kind of, oh, I read this and I, I thought you might be interested because it mentions Anne Steele. Um, well, I was interested, but mostly because I was discerning a call to ministry and Scotland, um, where I was at the time, St Andrews, was not a welcoming environment for discerning uh, a, a call to faith as a woman, um, a call to ministry as a woman. So I think there was a kind of a, a conversation there that for me was particularly important. Um, because she offered to me something that I wasn't meeting in what was quite an evangelical Baptist culture or a kind of more reformed Baptist culture, which was a much more nuanced view of gender in ministry that I particularly found incredibly helpful. Um, so I want to pick up um, on firstly what Ruth means when she talks about ministry, um, because she uses this language of recognised ministry. And I want to point that out. Sorry, that's my dog, because um, my husband's preparing infants for baptism downstairs. So she's trying to get into one of our studies. Um, she says, I do not mean, I know I do not mean only those who have been ordained or who are on the accredited list. She persistently describes ministry in the language of receiving, doing and thinking and giving, receiving and thinking. She mentions this for herself and then later for women in all sorts of other ministries. And I'll pick up on this more in a moment, but it sits closely with her view about how the church should sit apart from the hierarchies of the world. So she carefully questions the subject that she seems to have been appropriately given, um, that women and ministry need to be thought about as though there were two separate categories, perhaps particularly important considering the ecclesiology that she starts stating. For her, this is problematic, she maintains, as much for what it says about ministry as about women. And this is her key line of argument. So she says, the absence of a known history leads us to having an isolated identity. Uh, she cites Rich to explain this, that feminist gains in history are often strangled and wiped out. So each feminist work is seen as sporadic, isolated, a one-off issue, when instead it might be a long-standing historical journey. Most interestingly, she lays the power here with the we, but we have lost the story or not known what sort of questions we should ask. And so we have stood alone instead of together, reinventing the wheel, instead of allowing it to take us somewhere new. This opens up the question of who her rhetorical we is. The Baptist audience gathered to hear at the Whitley Lecture. Certainly there is the statement, in our history, there have been women, which suggests a broader plurality. We can hear the preacher, she is uniting her congregation into her thinking, so perhaps this is a broader Baptist we, 
all Baptists have lost the story of women's ministry and have not known what questions to ask. But the following sentence implies a more particular we. So we have stood alone instead of together. The implication being a throwback to her line that as a woman, we are doing something new and unusual. Now, you might wonder why I care about who we it is are in this moment. And that's because it changes who I think she is challenging here. Is the fault a wider denominational one? Or is the absence of our feminist history a challenge to women in ministry in particular? Does it change how we hear the rest of what she is saying? Who is it that has been reinventing the wheel? At this point, she moves on to describe uh, what she describes as Carlyle's great man of history model of doing theology um, and history, subverting this with an insistence that we need to hear the great women instead. She acknowledges 25 years on the danger of this being the way that she's done this. It identifies what it is to be a great man and offers that as an aspirational model. And so to do the same for women can still be problematic. They seem to be extraordinary where we feel ordinary and thus it does not necessarily open up the liberative possibilities of telling the stories of women. I'd suggest Ruth is harsher on herself than we are on her. So initially, she wrestles with how women were written up as passive in early Baptist churches, despite being numerically more significant. They were allowing women too much freedom and power. Her takedown of Keith Thomas, I've never met him, uh, for his concession language, I thought was particularly wonderful. And I'm only sad that she put it in brackets because that isn't an aside. That is the point of her section of this speech of this part of the speech. You can almost feel her wrestle with the way this history has been written as she seeks to word it differently. Why were women being given, and not only being given, but taking such a place? We remember that ministry is the giving and the receiving. So she places some of these great women together, Mrs. Hazard, Mrs. Attaway, Widow Bins, Jane Adams, the Deaconesses of Broadmead, Sister Anne Harriman, Elizabeth Gaunt, Anne Steele, Anne Dutton, Hannah Marshman, Dorothy Carey, Miss Fryer, Mary Flora MacArthur, Jane Henderson, Edith Gates, Maria Living Taylor, Violet Hedger, Gwyneth Hubble, Miss Clark. They may be great, but I expect they are still, even now, rather unknown. So actually, this Whitley lecture was symbolically important at giving them their place back at the table. So on page 15, she uses that refrain again. These and other women found themselves part of a, a movement which took their place in the giving and receiving ministry seriously, even to the extent of cost to themselves and to other members of the community. She argues that it was not a faith of comfort or sentimentality, but that of conscience and ordered by God, a very distinct view of church, Baptist church life in comparison to the hierarchies at play. One might suggest potentially slightly romanticised, but they had a giving, receiving ministry within fellowships who knew themselves to be churches of Christ in a lost world. It is something about the mutuality implied in congregational governance that I think that Goldborn Ruth, <laughs> you can tell why it's changing of language constantly, uh, means in this language that women were taken seriously enough to be charged with living out the gospel. And so they were taken seriously when they charged others to do the same. This seems clearer when we look at how the tone changes with the 18th century and the move to women in hymnody as a permitted form of ministry and then missionary wives. And she narrates how women had the freedom to offer to give ministry only in spaces restricted to women. Um, with the B BZM and then later with the Deaconess Order. Again, Ruth pays close attention to the structures and how in her words, the patterns change for them as increasingly they pass to churches. She considers the peculiar way Baptists then agreed to accredit women ministers and continues to highlight the structural patterns, how we have siloed women's work into marginalized wings of the denomination. Now it is in the midst of this discussion nestled in a quote which doesn't have a reference that there is an indented section on female ministers in Scotland, telling us of the call to Mary Flora MacArthur to Gaelic speaking churches in the 1930s and 40s. Nor was she inventing the wheel for the first time, reads the indent, for she followed the deaconess Jane Henderson. I'm struck that it is this passage which gives our author her title, for she is a Scot who came south to be ordained that there had been a recognised ministry for women 
in Scotland suggests something about the autobiographical in her opening narrative about identity and isolation. We're taken back to her initial concern. And so we have stood alone instead of together, reinventing the wheel instead of allowing us to take and allowing it to take us somewhere new. So it's no surprise then that she moves on from the structural patterning of women in ministry to their identity. It is this that sets Ruth apart from her contemporaries writing on women in ministry in Baptist life at the time as she takes on the equal but different category. This was a conversation that others had begun in Anglicanism as they'd begun ordaining women to the priesthood. For example, Elaine Graham's Making the Difference was published in 1995. Um, the question sitting behind these was whether women bring a different way of being a minister, and if they do, why? Uh, the nature or, nurture nature or nurture binary was a key cultural concept at that time, alongside women from Mars and men and from Venus, or whichever way around the planets were meant to go. Where Anglicans settled those questions through the ontology of their priesthood, Ruth's gift to Baptist was the argument that baptism in the ontology was the ontology ontological change for ministry. Men and women exist before God in the same way, created, redeemed and baptised. Ruth goes on to offer a theology of ministry that sits significantly at odds with other Baptist authors of that time who were keen to stress the difference between genders meant that women were needed in ministry. But Ruth is nervous of maintaining the and in women and ministry. If we and men have a difference, she maintains it's one of context more than essentialism. Here and elsewhere, she situates the struggles women in ministry have as one of existing within a social structure rather than as a difference that's bound up in being a woman in itself. There's a hesitancy in being part of these patriarchal structures. Her phrase is co-opted and the way it may minimise what is left to be done for equality. Her question is that the structures haven't changed for adding in the women. And so she worries about how that may further bar others from entering ministry. And I do wonder who she thinks others are, even when she's writing this. Um, it is here that the language of giving and receiving as a language of ministry ultimately makes sense. Women may do the same things as men, but because of the context out of which they act and from which they are perceived, it will be a different experience for both the woman and for those receiving her ministry. The double we continues to the end, a challenge for the women recognised by the structures and a challenge for the structures to change to what she hints at would be a more Baptist or certainly a more Christ-like uh, church. So I think, you know, questions are, are, are we still having that conversation about women and ministry? Um, I think, you know, I think I hear a lot of resonance in are women different to men in ministry? Um, I think how she understands that is, is interestingly different. Um, so I think there's something to explore there. And I think um, there's something to explore about who her we is. Who, who, how does that change how we hear it? Does it change how we hear it? Does it change it if we are a female minister in Baptist life? Or, or does it change if we feel like we're part of the structures? Who are the structures? She seems to be very nervous of those. Is she not the structures? Um, she's in fact giving the Whitley lecture. Um, and I think something of her own discontent in maybe acknowledging that is something of what comes through. Um, yeah, and how do we understand ministry I and mean, this language of giving and receiving? So kind of, I think those are the things I would draw out of it as kind of areas for exploration and discussion. So uh, back over to you, Andy, really. Uh, thank you, Beth, for uh, opening up the lecture, reminding us uh, bits perhaps that we've read or didn't actually see, because that's the thing about when we read something, other bits speak to us in different ways uh, and highlighting that to us and offering us some questions to explore. But um, we will explore however we feel led. So I wonder if people want to respond to something that Beth said or respond to the lecture. Um, you know, um, let's have a conversation. I was going to, uh, when I first went to read it, my expectation was it was going to be um, a biblical exposition of women in ministry. Because um, mm. that's uh, 20 years ago, there was a lot of that going around and reading it. 
I found it really refreshing in one sense that it, it was um, uh, a historical view and the way it seems in Baptist ways that uh, ministry grow, grows organically from the bottom and eventually the hierarchy or the Bible colleges catch up. I mean, some of the stories of, of how the early uh, women uh, ministers were treated, it's horrendous. And it, I just wonder, is that the, the way, I mean, I'm not necessarily that aware of historical Baptist stuff, but is this the pattern that will happen or has happened perennially when it came to discussion about slavery? Was it came from the bottom? One of our old ministers in 1850 was a, a black pastor. That that journey's taken 100 years. Will the same be true of um, uh, same-sex marriage? Will it be a 100-year journey where it's exper experiencing the, the benefits that lead to reflection? Or is that particularity here just for... This, this issue of, of uh, women in ministry? That was the question that I came as I read through thinking, is this, it's just the way Baptists do it. It takes a hundred years to realize what you ought to realize hundred years ago and people get hurt in the process, but we get there in the end. Is that the Baptist way or is that just human way? I don't know. I think that's a good question. And we've got some historians on the call, so maybe they can help us with exploring that. Um, I think you make a really interesting point there, Simon. What she does in the lecture for me is she offers us Baptist history as well. She tells us the story, which which isn't, but at, the way she tells the story is not to tell us the story of the great men, it's to tell the story of the women. In the, But at the same time, she's giving us our Baptist history, our principles all the way through, which is very typical Ruth. Uh, you know, she's not just, let me tell you about women. She's telling you, let's, let me tell you about Baptists and the women who have played their role in the history, which I think is a really good way of doing Baptist history, actually, um, which is typical of Ruth. But yeah, um, it, yes. Is this the is this the way that we always do? We always work from top down, and then the structures finally realise. I think in in many issues, I think that's true. I don't know if it's true of all of them. Um, I don't know if anyone else has got a thought on that. I'm looking at Stephen Copson as our major historian on the call, but there might be others of us as well. Though not a historian, it did uh, it did strike me a lot. Uh, of similarities between what she was saying there about the role of women in the Baptist church as to the, the role of the early church, particularly when it was the charismatic rather than the institutional that was uh, emphasised. Um, the idea of things being done pragmatically and then the theology coming afterwards was also a strike with me yeah. but i wonder whether the you know in answer to you know best question about which we i i think um she's putting that a very wide context because that's what she says we exist in a patriarchal context so she's not talking about anything other than i think of um you know the baptists within society mm. the widest mm. context that could be Um, I think just picking up from uh, other Simon's question, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in my memory, um, I've, I've heard Ruth make the case that, that Baptists typically do this stuff, um, you know, from, from the bottom and then eventually the structures catch up. So it happens on the ground. But I think that that's what she's doing in terms of her own reflection on her own life. So, you know, at one level, what she's giving us here is um, a retelling of Baptist history with, and the thing that strikes me through it is actually, I mean, she's a great history teacher, but then she goes on and does does some really serious theology off yeah. the back of that history. Uh, and that's one way of reading this Whitley lecture. A another way of reading this lecture is actually what Ruth's doing is, is giving us her own story and then doing her serious theology off the back of her own experience and then correlating that with her historical study. So I think you've got those two layers of personal experience and the experience of other women through the history, and the theological reflection arises from both of those, which I think gives the theology a kind of huge integrity because it's arising from what God is doing in real people's lives. And I mean, Ruth's style is, is often to start with either... I, I, I don't mean this in a, in a negative way, but to start with herself, 
because all Ruth really knows is her own experience of herself and the world and the people that she's read and the studies she's done. And then she extrapolates from there and says, well, you know, if this is true for me, maybe it's also true for others. And that gives this a, a, a freshness. I mean, I, I heard this lecture when it was first given. I was fortunate enough to be one of Ruth's students between 96 and 99. So I remember this. I remember her writing it and I remember this, this being given. Um, and it was hugely influential on on me um, as, as a young person who kind of turned up at the college, not entirely convinced about women in ministry. And, uh, it, you know, I, I think it, it really is it, it really is quite transformational. But I think for me, it's that it's the way that the story and the theology interweave that, that really drives it home so powerfully. Mm. I, I think this is this is one of the best Whitley lectures ever given, because it precisely, I think, um, precisely does what we, I, I guess, my hope is what Whitley lectures might do, is I think it was hugely influential and, and in terms of of shaping. And, you know, she says there is no history, there is no story. There was a John Briggs article back in 1986, which I think does some of the similar work, but I think Ruth is now bringing it here to a much wider audience um, and, and, and lays something down, which actually people couldn't ignore. Uh, yeah, so uh, for me... This is if you want to write a Whitley lecture, it's sort of one of the best examples of how to do it, I think, in a way that that people have to wrestle with and engage with. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction, Andy. The um, I think there is something about there being a, the great Baptist story that Ruth is very, very passionate about. Because if not, you are tempted to chase the same great women list as you do for great men and because of the way um church books church histories church life has been structured over the last 400 years is there aren't not there are not that many <laughs> headline figures that you can point to and even if you suddenly sort of discover uh, one that's unknown um I'm interestingly working on a suffragette who doesn't actually manage to get a mention in the church records at the moment um you you it's somehow recalling how baptist churches have not always been um so ignoring of women certainly in things like pastoral discipline cases where you see you know men are um disciplined for uh, abusing their wives or not not being caring and so on and so forth there is there is something that um filters through the church official records but there's also something, I think, again, about um, contextual reading of structures that certainly you go back to 1650. There are no structures. If you can understand something that in some ways um, creates a context where there is a shared um, a shared administration of authority. Um, it's only in the 18th, 19th century you get those sorts of opportunities um, and those sorts of institutions, which some would say we're still burdened with or otherwise today. <laughs> so um, I think it, it's somehow about, I would hate to put words into Ruth's mouth. It's actually the import, learning the importance of being Baptist will throw light upon the importance of women and of men um, working together in these congregational covenanted communities. No, I think that's a really key part. I think she's trying to say if we're properly Baptist, we'll have we have to recognise the role of women because properly Baptist means that ministry starts at baptism. So um, she always uses the phrase um, we um, we ordain women because we baptise girls. That's always her like a line that she uses, and I've heard her use it so many times um, to the extent that I wrote a book chapter with it as a title because I think it's a really interesting place to start, actually, if we're saying our theology of ministry is actually based rooted in our theology of baptism that says something about how we include women in ministry. We always have done, and this broader complementarity that she negotiates and she does in various other, like, books as well, articles, um, where she really insists that it's the complementarity of the whole church that matters. The complementarity is not male and female in a kind of narrow binary, but in the whole set of that kind of Pauline baptismal formula. Uh, um, so it's the slave nor free and all the rest that matters as much as the kind of women and men. So so I think that's a really kind of interesting, you know, um, you know, it was it was so rooted in that, in that kind of 
90s conversation in Baptist life was so rooted in this idea that we were so different. We we're like yin yang pairs and that was going to solve everything. She was very nervous of that and she offered a really different way and was saying, no, we have this theology of church that says something different to this. And actually it's an interesting kind of questioning of a uh, a kind of cultural assumption of the time, I think. She said on page 37 that male, is, you know, writing in that point, male is the norm and uh, and all else is deviance. Is that still true today? Or have we begun to break some of that down? In many ways, I think, you know, we might say that we are still reinventing the wheel. But I wonder if the context is changed. Now, I don't know whether I can, I don't think I can answer that as probably a male, but I wonder what, Beth and Helen and Sally on the call um, might think. Has that changed? Are we more aware to that, Sally? Well, um, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag too soon on a piece of Project Violet research, but the, there's a project that probably won't be included in the final report because it, it got delayed because of train strikes and things. But one of the things we looked at was um, uh, barriers to women rising into places of more significant leadership so not just ministry but more structural positions I suppose and it was really interesting that there was a generational difference in the perceptions of the obstacles so I, I think that I, I was interested in Beth's uh, noting about that sort of the, the polar nature of the 1990s debate which I remember very well and I also heard Ruth give this lecture when it was like it was the lecture year and I was um I was ordained by then but um, I hadn't been in ministry very long and it was a very liberating thing to hear and I don't think I'd realized how structurally oppressed I mean, I, I did in some ways where it was obvious. I hadn't realised the hiddenness of it until perhaps I heard Ruth speak. But that wasn't really what so much what younger women were articulating. It wasn't the same thing. So I, I think that there has been a shift. There has been a change. And I think that's good um, because whilst we've still got, we are, we are still reinventing the wheel, there is still structural tr struggle. But I think there are, there is a shift and things have moved and I think that's really good uh, but it might take a long time it might take 100 years do you know what the generational change is where does it happen like the age move okay so we looked I mean as I say I need to be a bit careful because yeah, yeah. I understand <laughs> yeah. I, I would say the concerns of the younger minister women ministers were um different so um it wasn't so much about trying to be like a bloke trying to do your ministry like a bloke it was much more sitting in the frame of a woman to do your ministry with all that, that involves children um responsibilities of that sort and actually feeling that the structures needed to shift to accommodate that rather than the person needs to shift to accommodate the structure. And I think that's a very significant change indeed, is it, it's, it's, it starts inside, it starts in the head. Um, and it's very different from what I felt and experienced as a, as a new minister um, in the 1990s. Um, so it does, does that respond to your question? I was wondering what the classification of younger and older was. Um, well, it was actually senior and junior rather than younger and older, but <laughs> the, the irony was that some of the seniors were younger than some of the juniors. <laughs> <laughs> For the reasons, of course, that women often don't enter ministry until they've had their families or, or you know, done things in a career so there's a really interesting um thing about the the demographic of women's ministry to start with it's just not you can't yeah. just map it onto 
um, male ministers experience in any way. It's multifactorial. So basically, one group was under 40. Um, and the other group was senior, but some of them were also under 40. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think the, the the other interesting thing is that if if you've got a, a younger woman who looks like a likely lass these days, she would tend to tend to get escalated through the structures more quickly because of um, people being aware that that needs to happen. And particularly because it was, this wasn't just Baptist, I should say, it was it was other denominations as well. Some of which have achieved more equality for women much better than we have which is interesting but they've done yeah. that structure they've done that by using the structures um perhaps rather than by letting the structure change organically which i also think is quite interesting i think i, I guess one thing you know she notes on page 28 that with her figures from 1992 which is interesting that she can only go back to that point and she couldn't get any closer to 97 when she was writing the lecture but anyway that was 102 uh, i don't know what the latest figures are but um, they're well over 200 I would imagine now I, I know the percentage wise they're still not great but I, I guess one of the differences from when Ruth gave the lecture and from when she came into ministry in the late 80s is that lots more Baptists have experienced women ministers mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that that is significant in, in, in shifting and changing the conversation even when she was writing in 1997 uh, the numbers you know, were still relatively low, um, and they are still low now. But, but actually, through a whole number of things, um, it, it does seem to me that more Baptists—I'm not going to say all Baptists—more Baptists will have experienced uh, the ministry of women in some capacity, whether that's at association level or union level, um, or whether it's just in a local church. And, and I think that has had an impact. It, and it's um, it's interesting because there's a big piece of research that's been done on. Um how congregations change their attitudes to women in ministry and it's not and they were like looked at lots of it, it was ecumenical and looked at lots of different kind of theological types and I use the phrase churchmanship very carefully here but churchmanships and all that kind of thing um and the the only um change on whether somebody was likely to say become affirming to a ministry having not been was whether they'd experienced the ministry of a woman so that was it was not to do with any theological type or anything else that was the the key change so um so that i think is is true um that being said i think it's interesting a kind of the the kind of senior juniors you know conversation i wonder whether one of the challenges is i mean i went into ministry from 21 you know and I, you look back on that and think what was anybody letting me do um and I met um Diane Tidball who was my regional minister um and I didn't hear a, a female Baptist minister preach until Myra at Regents preached so I had met and I met Julie Aylward so I'd met various kind of people um partly because they've been like been put in their path you know like here's Beth she's looking at ministry go and have this conversation with a female minister but um but not in a sense of like um having experienced their ministry as an active recipient of their ministry if that makes sense like I wasn't in their congregation and I just grown up with women in ministry being around you know um and I think that might be quite a different thing because I remember kind of suddenly discovering like huh this is an ordained Baptist minister preaching and I'd heard women preaching and women in other traditions preach but kind of this sort of moment of my life being like this is a first and I'm at theological college training with Baptist ministry like that had taken that long so um yeah and I realized that it was a gift for me because there was one but but actually you know it's quite interesting mm -hmm. um I'm conscious that a couple of people haven't said anything yet and I wonder what you made of the lecture and 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 or perhaps something from our conversation so far edward i'll look to you then maybe david um and helen actually as well yes helen <laughs> helen's helen's gone off screen so you can't pick on her. <laughs> oh there she is again um no great uh i loved reading it i've not read it read the lecture before and I think it's an excellent lecture, as has been said. I think Beth's comments and critique were really, really good. Um, I'm just left pondering. I mean, I had, interestingly, 
a similar response to Simon Harry um, in some degree. And see, I wonder, I was left wondering, do we change on issues about women in ministry, about um, um, issues of race, issues of gender and so on? Do we change because the culture around us has changed and there is a cultural drag in the sense of in the 21st century, women, you know, do everything, you know, just about, you know, um, the whole issue of gender, society, culture is way ahead of us. And I just, and the whole issue of race is there as well. I just wonder whether we actually change, if we're honest, not because of a biblical analysis or theological critique, but because there is this cultural kind of drag for us. And uh, linked into that, why is it therefore that we take so long to respond and I couldn't help feeling reading Ruth's lecture that whenever she speaks about patriarchy we could equally just put the word power in there and there are power it is <laughs> deeply insidious issues of power at work and where women fit whatever fit means they're promoted, given space, and so on and so on. But where there is critique, challenge, not just to patriarchy, but to power, then they are kind of, you know, pushed down or whatever. Um, yeah, so that's something of what I thought. I, I, th I think, David, you come in in a minute, and, and Helen, I, I think that's really interesting. So my sense of the history is that actually for a long time, you go back to the 60s and 70s, there were people saying, where are the women um, in terms of ministry spaces? Because they were there in the, you know, she says in, in the Baptist Women's League uh, and elsewhere. Um, but that doesn't get heard, I think, until there were in, until the kind of mid to late 80s, where there is then a group of women now in ministry who began to say to 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 advocate and summon to be heard which then shifts. And I think it, you know, it, it, it begins with someone like Margaret Jarman becoming president of the Baptist mm -hmm. Union. Uh, and then I think it perhaps the next stage is in, in some ways it is Ruth Whitley lecture. And so I think there, there was a real sense of, you know, we, and we look at other, other stories of the, the suffragette movement, I guess, of women actually saying, we want to be heard. We want things to change. We're unhappy now, uh, which actually I think wakes everybody else up to, to finally move. Um, so, so I guess that is a cultural shift a little bit because there was that going on. But there... I yeah, think I one of the differences is the Deaconess movement is moved onto the ministerial list. Yes, yes. So, so, yeah. so, so in 1975, late 1970s, yeah. ish, isn't it, that you have the Deaconess order moved onto the accredited list. And um, and so you suddenly have you have a huge number of women put into this language of of ministry in a particular way that they haven't been. And it's interesting, we're always keen to use recognised ministry, but it's a new form of recognised ministry, accredited ministry. And um, and I think, therefore, that it swells the numbers. Um, and and it it changes. They don't not, they don't have to lose their ministry if they get married. So it shapes reshapes the conversations in terms of who can stay and who, you know, all those sorts of things. So I think and instead of women being told to go and become deaconesses, because that's, um, you know, that's a much more appropriate role for women, uh, they become accredited ministers because that's the only option for women now. So I think I think actually there's a kind of an interesting kind of the recognised ministries kind of cement themselves. And so you have that groundswell of numbers. And then in the 1980s, you have the women led conversations about who are we? What's going on here? What do we want to do um, uh, that? Um, that Deb Brook actually ch like seems to have minuted quite a lot of them seem to organize things and and then the 1980s um BQ stuff so the kind of the late 1980s kind of I remember it's like 1987 88 isn't it um that the yeah. 
bidets and all the kind of theological questions come up. So yeah, eighty six, yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 it but it does seem to me to just it is those younger women actually at that point, like Ruth Goldburn, Ruth Bottoms, Myra Blythe, who begin to actually say we're 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 not satisfied with where we're at. Um, our experiences haven't been good. We want things to be better for those for us now, but also for those who follow us. Um, and we want to be in the structures and not just, yeah, Sally. And then I will come to David and Helen. Yeah, two two quick points that arose from while you were talking. Actually, I mean, one is that I I think um, reluctant though I am to acknowledge the Anglicans, their ordination of women was hugely important yeah. because it was visible and. I think, I mean, I, I was at London Bible College when that happened just before I went to Spurgeon's. It made a massive difference to the visibility of women in clerical positions. And I, I think that did help. And that was right in the middle of this period that we're talking about, the, the early 90s that happened. But the other thing I was thinking about was that there, that there was this these sort of key points that had been mentioned and I'm thinking that there were women at other points, but there are key points where women seem to have got heard. So their complaint was received. Mm. So th th there have been other times when there has been a complaint and it has not been received. And I'm wondering what particular circumstances facilitated that reception of complaint, that lament um, at those times. So the, the Myra, um, Ruth, um sort of period um you know wh why were they heard when their sisters had not been prior to that who were also speaking i think that's really interesting and i suspect that the reality is that there was a man who was listening somewhere in the structures because i don't see how else it could have been facilitated but i just think that that's quite an interesting interplay between the structures that we've critiqued and the organic change that we we want to see. Mm. Mm. David. Yes, well, I was thinking I was going to be quite quiet today and not say anything <laughs> because I come more from another planet here, very nearly in the South Pacific. And having spent over 40 years of my life uh, out, well, no, a lot more than 40, about 50 years of my life outside Britain. Uh, and in some ways, I've been living in a time warp because uh, uh, women pastors, female pastors, were only acknowledged in France about 20, 25 years ago uh, after a lot of campaigning by one lady, uh, which maybe didn't help, uh, help at first because uh, there was quite a bit of resentment because it was coming from one particular quarter. Uh, but now... I don't know how many, but probably a quarter of our Baptist ministers in France, I'm speaking off the record there, I think about God, uh, our women, uh, uh, we had quite a lot of studies uh, over several years before uh, the, the assembly accepted uh, that women and men should both uh, be allowed in the same way to the to the pastorate. And of course, the local church, being Baptist the local church, decides who they call, whether it's a man or a woman. Uh, the men that want certain women, the men that want certain men. It's quite uh, clear. Uh, I was very interested uh, in, in a lecture on the historical background. Uh, the, the 17th century churches where women uh, uh, had this equality, where it was even uh, a criticism, was it, which, it was leveled at the dissenters, that the women mm -hmm. had too much a say in the dissenting churches. And then when Baptists got more respectable in the 18th century and declined, of course, before the Methodist revival, then uh, uh, things got much more formal and women didn't have the same role. Uh, I did mention I'm in a double time warp at the moment. Uh, I'm now on Pacific Island where there are no Baptist churches and we're in a church which doesn't call itself a Brethren Assembly, but it's but it is. Uh, where women have few roles, uh, certainly they don't preach. Uh, it's very much like uh, probably 100 years ago uh, in uh, most Baptist church in Britain. Uh, we have even done some studies amongst the men, I should say, in, in the, uh, the, the, uh, the men's group, 
about the role of women. <laughs> Make you smile uh, in the church, and uh, one of our number, who, like myself, was a Baptist minister, but he was a military chaplain here for a short while, uh, and uh, uh, he did a study on the book of Valérie Duval Pujol. I don't know whether she's known. Uh, she was the he was she was the only World Baptist at the Pope's. Uh, meetings on the family a few years ago. Uh, she was chosen uh, by, the, by the Baptist World Alliance, a uh, French uh, Baptist theologian who actually uh, lectures in the Catholic Institute in Paris. And she's written a book, uh, uh, La Bible est elle sexiste, Is the Bible Sexist? Which is an excellent book. It gives the, uh, with Ruth, we had the historical uh, side to the question in British Baptist circles. Uh, with uh, Valérie, we had the uh, the biblical uh, perspective, which was very, very interesting. Uh, we did this study, of course, in our own church. Nothing's changed. Uh, yeah. The the interesting thing is, though, now we now have sermons which only last thirty minutes. That was the battle, and we have a time of questions and comments afterwards. And it's very, very interesting to note that most of those who make comments and very deep theological comments are the ladies in the assembly uh, who they have got have found a voice uh, to, to speak to men which they, they didn't have before so I find that quite amusing that maybe even in our brethren assembly we're making progress uh, but as I say in French Baptist circles uh, this is fairly recent it goes back 20, 25 years but I think we've uh, made a lot of headway since uh, mm. uh, in ministry are the ladies like uh, like Ruth says, just doing the same as men? Uh, that's, a, that's a big question as well. Are they just coming into a patriarchal structure? Uh, on Edward's point about um, do we just catch up with what's happening in the world, uh, like on feminism and other things, uh, I've just read a very interesting book, The Bible in Australia, which was written three or four years ago, and was uh, had the President's Prize, uh, Scott Morrison at the time. And that's uh, a very interesting book, uh, not specifically Christian, uh, written uh, written by a lady who has a Christ uh, Christian background, and the suffragettes movement and the liberation of women in Australia in the end of the 19th century was very much led uh, by evangelical women. Uh, which was quite interesting, uh, on biblical principles, uh, that since women were equal to men, women should have the vote and so on. So maybe uh, Australia may be an exception. Mm -hmm. uh, I have questions about the slavery question as well, uh, at least uh, in uh, the Anglo-Saxon world. Uh, and I've recently, my last point, I've recently been working on uh, the life of Fanny Crosby for the French Baptist Historical Association and uh, with uh, I've written an article which will be published next month. And it was interesting that in a very patriarchal setup in the 19th century, Fanny Crosby was not a Baptist, but worked a lot with Baptists. Uh, uh, she was more associated with Methodists, uh, Francis von Alstein, by, for her other name, of course. Uh, even at 84, she was still preaching to up to 3,000 people at Bible conventions. Uh, very evangelical Bible conventions, Baptist, Methodists, and others. Uh, it was a particular style of preaching. It may not have been the same style of preaching as that of the the, the, the ordained men, obviously, uh, who were around. It was interesting that even in those circumstances, uh, exceptional women, and of course, Fanny Crosby was blind almost from birth. Uh, ex she was. She fits into the category of the uh, uh, the, the, the uh, women who were had to write their own autobiography and who wrote hymns because they couldn't do anything else. But she found a much broader ministry uh, mm. in preaching in various circumstances. Thank, thank, thank you, David, for giving us that perspective, which, you know, the Ruth's type, subtitle is English Baptist Life. And, but obviously you, yes, you're reminding course, us yes. that, there are, that there are other yes. stories that we can tell from other parts of the world. Helen, I wondered whether there's something yeah, you wanted to offer and a reflection on the lecture or our conversation as well. No, I found it um, really interesting, both um, the lecture and the discussion. So thank you very much. Um, reflecting back to the mid 90s, um, I think one of the 
difficulties that I experienced particularly was that I came from a very um, the evangelical wing, if you like, of um, of Baptist life, and a lot of the uh, the people that I met, who the other women in ministry, came from a, a different theology uh, background, and 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 so that had two um, effects for me really. One was that it was harder in some ways i think for me to um receive any kind of acceptance from the more evangelical churches and yet i was one of them as it were um and and i didn't feel as though i was part of the women's ministry at that time um because I think they they felt that I was a bit strange because I was evangelical and evangelicals don't like women in ministry and, and <laughs> so it's I kind of didn't fit very well I think um I came into the structures pretty early on uh in my ministry because um I was involved with the Northern Baptist College and Spurgeon's College partnership with the church army um teaching evangelism and church planting and then um, into West Midland Baptist Association as it then was um, as uh, what effectively regional minister but it wasn't called that it was called mission consultant full-time so um, so I was into the structures and the structures were difficult I would say not just because of being female but because there was a lot of um, power as it was mentioned earlier on around uh, power structures and I didn't really fit into those very well um, and also I, I think um, because the the, um, the there was a reorganization coming up um, of the union and and that I think meant that certain things became quite difficult um, in some of the some of the structures it wasn't an easy time for anyone in those in that time of restructuring so um, yeah it was it wasn't easy <laughs> but um, I'm ever so grateful to all those who have uh, encouraged me all the way through, really. Hmm. I, I think it's, yeah, I think it's really interesting. Again, it reminds us that not every single person's story is the same, and that, and 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 actually, that where we think, oh, there'll be solidarity. Sometimes it doesn't feel like there's solidarity, and and there's been challenge and things like that. I think so, Helen. Thank you for sharing something of your your experience uh, mm. coming into ministry and in and those early years as well. Yeah, I think the other thing I would say is that. If you are initiating something new, uh, which has been my experience over the last 20 years with parish nursing, um, it's 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 not as easy to uh, gain acceptance in the structures if if it's largely uh, women that are involved with it. That's that's my been my experience. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not seen as being uh, something that is um, of the moment. It's 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 been hard to get any kind of finance. It's been hard to get any kind of recognition for for what's what is a fantastic ministry that's going on in so many churches right now. So yeah. Which again, perhaps takes us back to the lecture and, and and what Ruth was talking about in terms of what is ministry and what is not, and and we mm. talk about recognised ministry, but ministry in all its forms, and mm. you know, um, some of us might have heard Ruth talk last month about the deaconess movement, and she's been in one sense wanted to recover that story as a story of ministry, and there are some overlaps perhaps there with parish nursing in some ways yes. as well, and yeah, um, very much so, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Other comments or, or things as we begin to bring our conversation to an end, but I, yeah, I think observation. One, really interesting. What I've heard, I mean, 
I'm really interested. I think there is a thing that often women think actually they might be the outlier in women women in ministry. I think I've heard that before. And I think um I wonder if there's a presumed like homogeneousness that's not a word but you know what I mean <laughs> um and therefore actually all of us feel a little bit like well I don't quite fit that because I'm too young or or I'm too different or too evangelical to whatever it might be that actually there's a bit of something there um I and I wonder actually if that might be one of our commonalities ironically um and um and then actually I was also I've been thinking a lot about what does Ruth mean when she says structures because she talks about structures a lot but she never really identifies what she thinks the structures are she's got a big problem with them but she's never clear about what they are and I think do we mean I mean they you know I'm going to defer to Andy and what exactly the structures were in Baptist life in terms of kind of the the kind of cl like the governmental processes of the Baptist world, but I don't think she means necessarily DICOP and regional ministers. I think there's a bit of that because she talks about having to change the lecture halfway through because Pat becomes superintendent. So I think there is something about regional ministry, and I think there is something about um, are they pater like the kind of sh the um, maternity leave kicking in? So there is some. I think that's a bit what she means by structure, but I. It's interesting, isn't it, that we're also aware that one of our challenges in Baptist life is that the structure of the local having the power is the reason that we haven't been able to kind of sort our numbers out in the same way. So mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of I'm really interested in what what does Ruth mean when she says structure as opposed to, you know, where. Yeah. What we and What do we all mean when we say Baptist structure? Indeed. Yeah. yeah. I guess some of what she might mean is is around, you know, this is where she was advocating with others at, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, around the structures to do with being having a call to ministry, being trained at college, and then coming out the other side. I wonder if, and that was one of the places where she worked with others to make big changes to which the college principals did respond. I'm not saying everything then became good after that, but they did respond to that because I think because the other thing when it's really interesting, which means by structure. So Ruth has never been on a Baptist Union Council, as far as I know. I think Simon you know Ruth quite well I think that she's never been on Baptist Union Council she's never experienced the structures in that form now she's observed them from outside but she's never been an insider which for me is kind of if you think about Ruth Goldburn surely she should have been on Baptist Union Council at some point you know because of she's Ruth Goldburn and you know that's the kind of place where you might have expected her to be and see so I think I'm not sure if she means those kind of structures yeah I think it's an interesting question what does she mean by the structures and I don't know others might Want to respond to that as well but um yeah sally uh, only quickly i'm afraid i've got to go in a minute but sure. um i i mean I, when i read structures i very often i think i do see some of what you've just described in it but i also think principalities and powers actually uh and and, and it's something um a bit difficult to pin down but it's definitely there and it's definitely holds the power in the room and um, and that's why it's so difficult to break it because it's really hard to define what it is. I think, but it yeah. but it really is there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's that's good. So, yeah. On page thirty seven, she says the power of patriarchy, and I wonder if it's, it's those structures in, in whatever form they might take in 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 whatever way. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Sally. I I have a thought, which is probably not one to discuss because it will take another hour. But I've been re I was really struck again by Ruth teasing out the difference um, between men and women as not resting in ontology, but in contextual constructions of gender. And, uh, you know, in, in at that point in the mid 90s, uh, and this is a bit back to Ed, Ed's point at that point, you know, the, the popular construction of gender was pretty binary still. And I, I just wonder now so we're 25 years on, maybe more than more than that. And I think we have understandings of the construct the societal construction of gender that are a bit less binary than that. And I, I just wonder how that might mean it could be reframed uh, as as society and as we understand gender and as women and men are shaped differently by their experience of the context in which their gender is formed. I wonder what that would do to this lecture landing in 2024 in a different way. 
well, I can't give it in 2024, but that's exactly the top of my doctorate. So, <laughs> like that, as I, I was hoping it. you might come in on this. <laughs> <laughs> I, because I think that's really interesting, and I think I think it's all the things. I think it's the age we went into ministry. I think it's the uh, generation we're in. I think you know we you know um i think our women of color have a completely different experience of embodiment and gender um and we know that i mean but we haven't got it well documented yet gail's get, getting there and and like i mean she's done a fabulous phd i've yet to read but because it's not in the library yet but um uh but i think project violet's picked up on a lot of that from what i've begun to hear but i think there's all sorts of kind of questions but i think things like theology as well like i want to know how do i evangelical kind of women see themselves compared is it different to those of us who might say we're a bit more on a liberal spectrum you know kind of where 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 how are we formed into our gender and how does that shape us does it yeah are we shaped yeah and d- depending on our kind of church backgrounds and if we were converted in or you know all those sorts of questions I just think it's a really I think I'm really interested to know how our engendering happens and then how we live that out in church life how we choose to interact with that and how we don't choose sometimes to interact with that I think um I've got all sorts of questions about that so yeah so if you're a female with <laughs> ministry in Baptist life apologies you'll get at some point spammed by me several times begging you to fit in some things so please do <laughs> I'll be shameless. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think. Go on, sorry. No, go ahead, Wood. Um, yeah, I was just reflecting as folk were talking, and now Sally's gone. I was going <laughs> to carry on with her thought. I mean, in this lecture, Ruth does trace um, Baptist life and the place of women within Baptist life, and how, in a sense, organic it was initially and women took on all sorts of roles um but as i think i couldn't i can't find it just clicking through the lecture now but coming into the 18th century 19th century i can't remember um it became the baptist church whatever became you know structures more organized and so on and that uh you know the space that women had seems to have been squeezed out which i thought was a really intriguing interesting point but just coming back to sally's point about the principalities and powers and i mean we've touched on race and gender and so on i just wonder whether the elephant in the room so often even with the present conversation about same-sex marriage and so on I just wonder whether the elephant in the room is power rather than anything else. And uh, yeah, that determines so much. With Beth's comment and then Edward's uh, response there, I wonder if that's a good place to stop. Um, And I think what we want to say is, uh, Ruth, if you ever get around to watching this, otherwise we'll communicate it to you anyway. We're grateful for the lecture that you gave uh, and for the impact it had at the time, and uh, I think reading it again, it, it's it's a lecture that still lives on and continues to challenge, lays places already that uh, Ruth is touching on on that lecture that perhaps speak to the present in, in so many ways. Uh, and uh, so, yes, thank you. And uh, we will be back next month to look at uh, communion, I think it is, uh, with Keith Jones and his uh, lecture exploring the place of Baptists and the Lord's Supper, which for me is actually another area in which we haven't really done a lot of thinking. And so it would be great to revisit that lecture and, and, uh, and to explore it again, what that might mean for us then. Thanks, Andy. Thank yeah. you.